I'm Steve Kuhn, and I'm talking about the spin assignments in Selenium 71 and the nucleus of Selenium 71. And my advisor is Dr. K, and I sponsor by the NSF RU program. Selenium 71 has 34 protons and 87 neutrons. There are two models used for describing the nuclear structure. The first model is the single particle model, and that treats each nucleon individually and says they're a lot like electrons in the sense that they form energy levels and they follow the Pauli exclusion principles. So the first two protons uh, form the first energy level and one spin up and one spin down, so they have no net spin or angular momentum. And then the energy level is full, so the next proton is actually going to a high energy level. Because there's an even number of protons, they have no net angular momentum because each time one spin up and one spin down. For neutrons, however, there's a 37 neutron, which is, has no other neutron form in it. So that gives the ground state of Selenium 71 a net angular momentum. The other model is the collective behavior model, which treats the nucleus more like a jar of marbles and says they all rotate together or vibrate together. Uh, this is a level scheme of Selenium 69. A level scheme just shows all the energy levels and the transitions of the nucleus. So the horizontal bars are <coughs> the energy levels, and the arrows between them are each of the possible gamma ray decays or transitions. We can see the spin assignment in the left corner of each energy level. And the spin will always change by 0, 1, or 2. Uh, so, Selenium 69 is the next lightest isotope of Selenium 71 that has an odd number of neutrons. And we can see it shows a lot of single particle <coughs> behavior, which is characterized by irregular changes in angular momentum and energy, and lots and lots of uh, different energy levels. Uh, we can see some collective behavior, which is these band structures that always have a change in angular momentum of two. If we look at the next highest uh, isotope of selenium-71, we have selenium-73, and we can see strong collective behavior with these bands throughout. And there are two bands for each parity, and these bands start on opposite uh, spin assignments. So this one's three halves and this one's five halves, <coughs> for example. So the research I was actually asked to do this summer is to confirm these transitions, which has been found by Ohio Wesleyan researchers <coughs> the last couple of summers. And the researchers have also changed this negative parity bounds significantly, so only a small amount of data has been taken about the spin assignments of each of these energy levels. Uh, so I was trying to find the spin assignments of, of these using first dating and then DC ratios. Uh, the data actually comes from an experiment at Florida State University. Uh, we take sodium and slam it into an iron target, and that forms rubidium-77, which can decay many different ways, but one of the ways is by emitting a neutron, a proton, and an alpha particle. But then it doesn't have enough energy to spit out a nucleon, but it still wants to lose energy, so it shoots out gamma rays, and the gamma rays are what we measure. This process creates many different nuclei, um, and there's one produced about every 100 nanoseconds, and the typical decay time is one nanosecond. So how are we going to measure, how are we going to tell if the gamma rays that we measure at each of these different detectors at different angles, how are we going to, how are we going to tell if they're from Selenium 71 or if they're from another nucleus? What we do is uh, something called gating. So we look only at a decay that happens within 100 nanoseconds of a decay that we know we want. So if we know we have an energy level of this, we'll say, only show me uh, gamma rays that happen within 100 nanoseconds of this. So then that, that will include all the decays before, but it will exclude the decays from a different nucleus. Gating will only show gamma rays that are in series, not in parallel. So if we gain on gamma 2, we'll see gamma 3 and gamma 1, but not gamma 4. So this is also useful for determ determining where a branch leaves a main band. So this shows how useful <coughs> gating is. Before this 233 band, 
looks insignificant compared to all these other bands. But if we gate, we can show that this is clearly part of this new 71. Once we have the transitions, we can try and figure out the spin assignments uh, using something called DCO ratios. DCO ratios depend on the fact that gamma rays can be emitted in two different ways. The quadruple radiation, which has a change in angular momentum with delta i of 2, and dipole radiation, which has a change in angular momentum of 1 or 0. If it's quadruple, uh, it'll emit the gamma rays more intensely at 0 degrees than at 90 degrees. And if it's dipole, it's the opposite. So because we have detectors at different angles, we can measure the different intensities at different angles with specific gate. And then uh, we can determine the change in angular momentum of a transition. So to measure the intensities, all we do is uh, just look at the different areas of the counts we see using the Gaussian fit, and then just divide them. <coughs> Uh, so that will give us an experimental value for the DCO ratio. And then we also plug in what we expect to see as our um, theoretical value of DCO ratios. So um, there's three possibilities. Delta i equals 2 is this dot. And delta i equals 1 or 0 has many different values because dipole radiation can have quadruple radiation mixed in with it, what we call the mixing ratio. And so if there's quadruple radiation mixed in with dipole, it's going to change the angle that it's most intense at, and also that'll change the zero ratio. So that's where we have the spectrum, which we display with an arc tangent uh, so we can see a wider contrast of values. So our results were when we started off, we thought that this 1040 transition had, this 1040 energy level had a spin assignment of five halves. But looking at the 759 transition, it seems likely that this is a quadruple transition, or delta i equals 2, so that would leave us at the 7 halves. We compared this transition to transitions in germanium 69, and we saw that uh, in germanium 69, it's a similar transition that has a large mixing ratio. So we looked and wondered if this, could be, this transition could be a large mixing ratio too. And this graph shows that. If this is a large mixing ratio, it would show that this is a quadruple transition, which it is. So that's how we concluded that this, this is 7 halves minus. But as we saw in Speedium 73, the parity bands start on opposite numbers. So if we're going to change this from 7 halves to 5 halves, from 5 halves to 7 halves, we have to have this one start at 9 halves to 5 halves. So we wanted to see if that would work. And it actually fits the data better than the other assignment. Because the 622 transition looks like it's a quadruple transition. And these uh, bottom energy levels have been firmly established by many different publications. Also, germanium 59 shows these two 9 halves minus uh, states as well. So uh, we've, we've come up with a new spin structure for these two negative parity bands. Uh, in conclusion, we have five suspected new transitions. Uh, we've measured 18 different spin states, DCO ratios, and we've changed these so the nucleus looks a lot like uh, uranium-69, <coughs> a lot of excitation energies, and it looks more like the collective energy, a collective model with Krypton-73 at higher excitation energies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is open for questions? Is that on? Is this data that you gathered or that was already gathered? Uh, well, the data was already was all brought in from Florida State University's experiment, but the uh, DCO ratios um, were all measured from the data that we acquired. So, um, you said that the the 
different, uh, the new measurement fit the previous data better than the, the previously understood thing. Uh, how complicated would it be, and I, I'm a computer scientist, not a physicist, to just maybe try a bunch of different measurements, would that be a very computationally complex thing to do to see if you can find better fits than the ones that are currently there for established data sets, or is this? Well, there's really only two possibilities for each of these um, energy levels. So the reason they, were, they weren't assigned this before is because we didn't really have any data looking at it. But now that we do, it's, it's clear that it should be this. So I guess <coughs> there, we could try different possibilities, but it'd be very unlikely that those would be better. Okay, but when you measure it directly, it becomes pretty clear. Yes. Okay. 